Welcome. I've been doing some pondering, as Robert has said, during his son's office, on certain things. I don't think I'll be turning the Sangha towards Nisargadatta beginning in a week. I think I'll lose people. The true Nisargadatta is no longer a bhakta at the end of his life. And we'd lead though we would possibly lose those who are very bhakti oriented by going full Nisargadatta. So I'll just bring him up from time to time. I don't know whether we'll have a class or not. But I have to ask all of you something. I've got some questions to ask. Mary, why do you say our Sangha is too masculine? Out of the 11 or 12 people here, six are women. What is your feeling? What is your evaluation? I didn't, first of all, I didn't mean to say that in a, in a negative way. Um, but from what I feel, um, the feminine energy here is not very um, vocal or that's seen, true. Vocal or seen or um, and I'm being in it from when I first started. And still am today very shy and timid and but um, I just feel that um, I agree with you. Yeah, I just feel that it, it, we, we really need to uh, bring it we really need to bring it now look. I'm feeling it. <laughs> I'm feeling that fire and we need to be on fire. Now we could ask the three women who never come on or hardly ever come on, like To, Sukai, or Brenda, to reveal why they don't reveal themselves. What's the fear? Can any of you describe why? Don't show yourself, announce yourself, and tell us what you want. Do you want more safety? How do we give it to you? Michael, I'd like to ask you. Why you never say anything in satsang, except when invited, then you will give a one or two or five word answer. What's your fear? Are you afraid of choking with the sentence, not being able to speak it and be ridiculed? What's your fear? No, I'm not afraid of choking on a sentence. Um, just I don't have too many concepts to share. Honestly, it's just so simple. 
Oh, it's I, don't so have, simple. I don't have that many words bouncing around in my head. Okay. My, my experience. I don't, I don't, uh, <clears throat> I'm not self labeling like what's going on with me. Um, <clears throat> Plus, you know, I don't articulate things too well. So I've kind of become lazy on that. Possibly why. Okay. Cass. Okay. Plus what? I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. When I initially came on the group, I went, wow, there's so few women. Um, why? Yeah. I understand. So, well, look, there's Veselina, Mary, mm. Cassie, uh, Tobe, Sukai, and Brenda. Mm. But the women are hiding. Mm. They feel the masculine energy too, and that they can't really relax in this environment. There aren't too few women. I think there are more women here than there are men. Mm, it's funny that you're right, but I felt like there was so few women. I know, me too. I know exactly what you mean. Mm. And I ask, what well, do you think the loss of Angela has anything to do with it? Angela, to me, counterbalanced the masculinity from me. She had a very welcoming, open, feminine presence. What do you say now, Cassie? I don't know who Angela, I never met Angela. Okay, well, drop yeah. that part. Just tell us what else, keep going. Free associate. I guess it's like, it's very hard to, to you feel safe enough as a as a woman. It's crazy, I know, but as a as a feminine energy, it tends to run. It tends to run away. It's feminine strength. How do we make you feel safer? More safe. Oh, wow. I just don't blame anybody. It's just something that's there. I don't see any, any you know, I can't see how anybody can help. I you know, I don't understand how anybody can help. It's just something that I've felt all my whole life. So, you know, where is that? How is that? Okay going to blossom, you know? How is that feminine going to blossom? I don't know. Tove, please show yourself today. As risky as it may seem, you come all the time. We want you to be more, I do, of an integrative presence. We welcome you, or try to welcome Sukai also, and Brenda, I don't think I've ever seen. Veselina, why are you so quiet in satsang? Unless I call on you. Um. I don't know. It's just uh, sometimes I want to speak, but uh, I want um, I'm like a little bit shy, or I don't want to interrupt somebody or to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And also, um, 
because my I feel my life is very like external, externally oriented, and I can I don't share very like I can only share my momentary state how I feel. I can't really. Like, I don't, uh, I can't share like, uh, not not much spiritually is going on with me. What do you think is spiritual? Well, yeah, having spiritual experiences. What do you say to that, Mary? I don't, I understand her, but I, we, we can't stay, um, we have, we, I just feel that the minute you start to express whatever it is, nobody's here to judge anything, nothing, because whatever is shared will help, will be an insight for somebody, will, so I, I just encourage, I encourage to speak. Eddie, what did you come here looking for? Somebody who could explain like the experiences I've been going through to see if like I'm even like on the right path in life. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you you answered that like on the first first time I was here, so that made me very happy that like I'm not like like I wanted to talk to somebody who's like uh, completed the journey, if you will. So because if, like I were to ask somebody else who hasn't had like any sort of spiritual experience, like they first off, they probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about or if they have, I don't know like where they are like for like uh, on the completion, uh, of, like spiritual progress, if you will. So it's like, I can, it's like I wanted to find somebody who like knows what they're talking about because then they know what I'm talking about. Because like I, I could see the potential of like the ego getting in the way of that, having any type of spiritual experience and then thinking like that like we've made like great advancement, but in reality it's like one percent. So I was like, it's probably best to find somebody that knows stuff that's gone through it before. Mark, what say you regarding this overall? I have several observations. Uh, the first one is very few people are as shy and introverted and timid. I used to be so timid. I had to overcome it in order to be gainfully employed as a young, young man and onward. So I understand that Michael and Veselina, whenever you express what you have to express, there's more that, that there's more than the words that comes out. I also have a hard time articulating things, which I've stated many times. It does get better with practice. Um, but I also have that issue. But I always enjoy hearing from you guys and from everyone here. So um, the only way it's going to improve is through doing it. Um, the other thing is, yes, we have about half men here, but the men are very overall, like there's a lot of feminine energy coming from us guys here. In, in, including myself. I've always regarded myself as a man who has a very highly developed feminine side, always. And I'm an artist, I'm a sensitive soul. I love wildlife, I love animals, I, I love women, I love people, I love everything. So 
Uh, the last point is there are those, I think, that are fearful of uh, being recorded and being posted online. So those are, those are my points. Yeah, there are. Stevie. Well, first I'd like to say, I'm so happy we're talking about this. This is great. Uh, I actually, amazingly, the last like two weeks or so, I've actually, for some reason, felt the same thing about the, the feminine. I, I remember counting people uh, and <laughs> being like, okay, male, female, male, female. And the numbers are usually pretty close, but there there is some sort of, uh, I don't know if it's, whether it's real or not, but I, I was feeling it as well. So I was very um, surprised and sort of delighted at the synchronicity that uh, Mary and Cassie were feeling that way as well. Um, I don't know why. I uh, couldn't say why, um, but I think uh, I think it's not just here. It's in a lot of places in life where the male, uh, it's probably been happening for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, but I, I also feel that there's a, there is a wonderfully sweet, uh, intimate, delicate, but very powerful feminine side here. Um, and I definitely would love to see it blossom. Um, I, I would do everything I can to hold a space for that and embrace any, anyone here, the feminine side of any male here or, or the, the full power of every single woman here, because to me, the, the feminine energy is, is incredible. It's so, so, so deep and, and powerful and, and life changing. Uh, so I, I, I just want to say that I embrace all of you to, uh, if you ever feel like sharing something of that nature, um, yeah. You know, uh, many Yana leaning teachers deal with this directly by including the divine feminine into their worship. It's kind of an artificial way. It's like paying lip service to the feminine aspect in all of us and then worshiping that as a abstract entity, Kali, Kali energy, Gopi energy, but it's artificial. It's like, say, yeah, we recognize the feminine and we honor the feminine and we respect the feminine. We bow to the feminine and it does seem to work in the sense that there's more women that go to those kinds of satsangs. But like I said, ours is just about equal, men and women. And yet you don't get the feeling of the women being that present, that integral. And I myself, having been called Betty by my father, am intimately aware of the feminine. That's why Janet brought me alive because of the feminine energy, the love she had for me, the desire she had for me. Same with Dia, same with Angela. Without that, I feel kind of dead. It helps to keep me alive is to feel the feminine wherever it's demonstrated wherever it comes out and brings fire to our Sangha. Mary, bring fire. Cassie, bring fire. Ed, I want to say something. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Your mic's off. So one of the things I believe the feminine does is it cries. That's my, my feminine coming through. And the crying is beautiful. It's not something to be feared of or, or, or scorned. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the tenderness, it's the love, it's the sadness, it's the grief. The grief of the world. And if that gets squashed, that doesn't work because then the flow is gone. And the flow is allowing that to be there. And yeah, it does get hard when I am told that I cry too much or something like that. Because it is just the most wonderful thing to be able to just allow that to be. It's just beautiful. So, yeah. Have you felt limited in that way? In the Sangha? Yeah. yeah, you did say something. And I don't want to blame you because, of course, you know, it's always me trying to sabotage my own self. But, you know, yeah, you did say something to me about crying too much. And maybe that was just to bring it up. Maybe you were just doing it. I mean, that's what I always look at it. I go, wow. No, crying is really important. It's incredibly important to just weep. It is for me. Yes, I agree. It was like Ed was complimenting you on that. Usually that crying or laughing, it won't happen unless you're in that high state. That's what I felt like when I was sort of saying that. I didn't hear you. Yeah, we're not audible? Yeah. Is it clear? Okay. Uh, I, I was telling uh, that uh, when you said, I was feeling that it's not, it's not usual if a person is like crying or laughing unless you are in that uh, ecstasy, um, the divine ecstasy. So I, I, I felt like you're sort of mildly uh, saying that, complimenting her being in that state. Whenever you said, yeah. I agree. I wasn't in any way when I mentioned our crying girl as being lesser. It was more more than ability to be constantly open, like Mary is. I was always told that I cried too much, always, Cassie, always. I was very empathic, very, I'm very empathic. I feel everything and I cry just by looking at somebody and it touches me deeply, like I'll just shed tears. I, so, and I always thought it was something, there was something wrong with me, something wrong with me, but I think it's, now it's, it's just the most beautiful gift. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. To just Not be only, I mean, and shed and let it out. Yes, thank you. For the longest time, I thought I was like a, a stone type, and I, I noticed that whenever I see some people suffering or some people crying, I get tears automatically for few one or two years since it's been happening. It just I, I go, it's, it's an, I mean, I really like to have your state, uh, Cassie, the, you know, you laugh and cry and it's not, <laughs> I, I can wish for that and, you know, it, it doesn't happen, but by the way. By the way, according to Mark, in response to Mark, Generally, I cut off the rec video recording at the end of my talk when we get into questions and answers.
with the Sangha precisely for that reason. Not always, sometimes I forget. But I understand that. But the thing is, I've also been telling people here and everywhere, there's a need to be open, not hide your feelings, hide your fears, or anything like that. And I'm trying to promote an ability to be open about one's inner states. I remember Janet who would get become a tiger, an angry tiger, when she heard that I had spoken of her to someone else. Even about a thing such as she was on a fast, she considered that a major fault on my part to talk about her when she herself talked about herself all the time on her website, Facebook. But if I repeated the same information, uh, she tore, wanted to tear my heart out. So what I'm trying to inculcate here is an ability to relate our deepest revelations, to be able to fall to the feet of everybody else and feel free to cry, to worship, to kiss the feet of the other, and just to have nothing, to become nothingness. And this requires constant attention to the act of sharing. In a way we share even when we just come here and are silent, like Michael tends to be. That's a sharing of his inner state. But I also like to have people learn how to articulate their inner state and to communicate that way about their inner state because it allows for better communication. Like Cassie thought I was censoring her for being crying too much. I wasn't. It was a kind of laughing, picking out of you. That is your quality. The woman who cries. That's your strength too. Yes. <laughs> now, James, you sent me an email with a question. Whether the diff what's the difference between Ramana's eye and the circuit as I am. Yeah. The point is, stick to one teacher. Don't listen to two teachers. It'll tear you apart and hinder your, your growth because you'll always be trying to figure out what's the truth by splitting the difference between the two teachers. He is teaching from his own experience and uses his own words. And none of them were English. So you get the translations of I or I am. And it's really complicated to try to figure them out. For me, to use the term I or I am means it's not a concept. But it's a feeling inside of ourselves. The feeling of I. The feeling of I am adds a tone to it, which is bringing it into existence. But if you hunt for the I feeling as opposed to the I thought, or the I am feeling as opposed to the I am thought, and just go into the feeling mode, you can't make a mistake. Just feel for yourself. Just feel for yourself. Go inside into your body and feel for that feeling of self. And then stick there, rest there. That's the whole practice. Just like Mark says, 
He knows what his practice is, which is to be in what he calls his sense of beingness. Now, you can know the sense of beingness by knowing the gap that Robert talks about between two thoughts or between being awake and asleep. Or you can know it by constant self-investigation where you get to know all of your internal states from the emotions such as love or recognition or depression and thoughts and emotions and one's sense of presence as an energy body that dwells within your own physical body and around and then there's the deepest state there's the state of just being aware and if you emerge submerge in that state you can have all kinds of blissful experiences because the being the state is bliss and if you can stay there once you discover it and stay there, your practice will be rather rapid. Your progress will be rather rapid. So it's complicated. It's not something you learn overnight. It's by exploring all of the consciousness in you. And then at some point, recognizing the very most important first experiences. What? You are not your mind. Your mind is just somewhere inside of you. It's just talking, 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 a talking transmitter. And yet, for most people, the talking becomes everything. They listen to the mind all the time. And if you're a schizophrenic, you begin to believe the mind is another person that's invading you and dominating you, or things like that. Yes. <laughs> or it believes, makes you believe that you should kill somebody or kill yourself. But it's better eventually just to find a sense of beingness. It has no thoughts. It's a kind of thing within you. It's an entity within you or a state within you. And you first notice in you as the deepest part of you. And when you go into it, you may begin to lose consciousness like Max always does. And he has a hard time coming out of it in order to say something. Same, I'm sure, with Mary. And with Stevie. And with Jay, he's not here today. probably with Cassie, although I don't know Cassie that well. But I do know that she's a devotee of Nisargadatta, but the Nisargadatta from his early way of teaching. Have you read his little book, Self-Knowledge and Self-Realization? No. Um, it's no, on my I website. It's pure Bach. I downloaded, it. I downloaded it. He has downloaded it. But every time I try and read anything else than I am that, I just don't like it. So I go back to I am that. <laughs> That's why I'm reluctant to make that turn towards a Nisargadatta direction for the Sangha. And instead, staying in the bliss and in the beingness rather than going beyond and telling you where you're going to be in 30 years. Yeah. It feels right. That feels right. Mohammed, what do you feel about what we've been talking about? You came a little late, and I, I opened with asking the question about why to some women and to some other people, like Stevie, our Sangha felt too masculine. 
that women were not sharing their perspective about what's going on for whatever reason, out of fear of being laughed at or fear of being harmed somehow by people's reactions. Uh, Are you hit repeatedly hit your microphone into a wall? No, I I was uh, wearing a headphone. I was wearing uh, uh, okay. what is uh, earphone? Or, I okay. don't know the name. Okay. Uh, so what about okay. the the question I ask? What I are you? That why do you hide yourself and not come and show your picture? Why do you ha when you have a question, you oh. write it in the chat box rather than speaking it? What is the reluctance to show yourself to the Sangha and to be up front with yourself? Uh, I feel that I love this painting, the painting of uh, this girl. What? The painting. The painting. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. So why does that prevent you from showing yourself instead you show the painting uh, because i love this painting that doesn't answer my question you can have I it behind painting. you you can have it behind you you can have it next to you you could we could show yourself kissing the painting i don't have it on my own i have it on my mobile maybe i will print it i print it on a paper or something uh, plus, I, my English is bad. I don't feel, I can write English. I can write English. But speak, no. I can't speak very well. And that's the reason you hide? Hmm? That's the reason you're afraid of people uh, laughing at afraid. you because of your, of your English? Not afraid. I feel that I can't communicate through. Uh, You're communicating very well. You're communicating mm. very well. Okay. Uh, sometimes on and off. Sometimes I feel uh, when I am happy or something. When I happy or I feel good, I can speak. I feel uh, sociable. But when I feel depressed. Or something, my I forget all uh, all uh, thing. I can't speak at all when I am depressed. But uh, I am happy now and uh, I feel relaxed. So I can speak. I feel uh, that my English is good. But when I am depressed or uh, feel uh, sad or uh, I feel introvert and I feel uh, I can't speak. There is no memory. There is no ability of speaking. I feel that I am heavy, so I, can, I can't speak. Uh, when, I, when I don't speak, there are many reasons, not, uh, not uh, fear or something, just uh, my emotional state or, uh, or memory or something like that. But the question of, the, of today, of uh, the feminine and talking and all of that, I, I feel that the talk of Shakti and the way you teach always uh, go uh, towards the sexuality and this open thing and this Ramakrishna language of uh, the genitals and the, the sexual organs of the body and all of that because uh, sexuality is uh, connected to Shakti and Kundalini and this energy. Maybe because of that, uh, uh, women uh, or girls in the Sangha is afraid of talking because these are so sensitive uh, subjects. What do you think? No, I don't think so, but you may be right. I haven't Maybe. made much emphasis on that at all in, in months. What? 
I have not made any emphasis on that at all. Yes, yes, I know, I know. I, 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 I say maybe before, maybe before, maybe what about since. Now? So, what about now? Uh, you say uh, that this time, at the time I talk, uh, women are afraid in the sangha, the feminine, the feminine aspect of the sangha are afraid now. Uh, uh, it was maybe... brought to my attention by Mary yesterday, so we, I thought we'd explore it. Stevie agreed. He felt the same thing, that the masculine predominates and the feminine regresses. Well, I should say also that... Um... This is also one of the safest and most um, uh, intense feminine energy places that that I come to. Even though sometimes it feels like it's uh, there's more male energy. Uh, when I first came here, and Angela um, was Angela, <laughs> uh, that was one of the first times I'd ever felt the full. Um, breadth and and power and depth of yeah. of yeah. A, a woman and she was so open and pure and and powerful and i've i've felt that that has been with me ever since and every time i come here it just feels like such a safe place to to for me to share and and uh be myself and and the male bravado that was all around my life, all of my friends. Um, I felt very sort of uh, left out because I, I wanted to be genuine and, and sensitive. And a lot of people that I knew were just very into being strong and yeah. not broken, not dysfunctional. And I, I was just sick of it. So as soon as I came here, yeah. I, I find this place a very safe and, tender, gentle, receiving place. Um, so, yeah, that's... Do you, I, miss, I agree do, you, do you miss Angela as much as I do, Stevie? Yeah, every single... Well, I don't, I don't know exactly how much... What do you feel her. when you saw her? What did you feel? When, when I first saw, saw her? her? Face, huh? oh. It was like yeah. magic, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, it was, it was like seeing a unicorn or something, like something, uh, something that just like is so rare, and you almost didn't even, you you sort of, uh, I almost started to believe that it didn't exist in the world anymore. What did you uh, see? What did you feel? I saw. A person, a soul that was entirely unfettered by any sort of, uh, even though she was totally um, broken and and dysfunctional and 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 just like crying and and everything, it just it was perfect. It it. There was no sense of of um, that her feeling was wrong, or that she she didn't have the right to feel that way. She it was so pure and so uh, connected to a place so so deep that I personally I had I had not felt that from anybody in a very long time, and and what it made me feel was that I could exist in the same way that I could, I could exist from the same depth. It, it basically, it felt like she had come inside of me and pulled my spirit, which was way in the background, 
looking at the world as if the world was this this dark cold place where no one understood and she just it felt like she was she came inside of me and ripped my spirit out into the world and it was exhilarating and then she it felt like she was speaking what i was feeling my deepest 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 feelings and i i truly believe that all of us um as we as we come back in towards our our truest deepest self everything becomes um we become closer together sort of like there's a point for me it felt like there was a point where spirituality was taking me away from the world far far away from the world and everybody else and then there was a point where it went through and was back at on the surface again somehow and angela was that exact moment the moment that she started speaking i like if if my camera was on at that time you probably would have seen me like this <laughs> like my jaw must have hit the floor i it totally exploded my entire sense of being and i felt like i was re-embodied into the world with the fullness of my heart and spirit just glowing and it was because she was just she wasn't doing anything special she was just being real she was admitting her own her own um brokenness her own pain she she didn't claim to be um a realized being or or anything and she was that she was so humble that way that she, she wasn't that way originally she didn't feel broken at all two years ago that came later when she was talking when you initially saw her, which was about two years ago or two and a half years ago, she wasn't broken at all. She was, I, let me tell you how I saw her. I saw her as a saint. So deep, so utterly quiet. And when I looked at her, I just wanted to fall to her feet and worship her because she was so pure. She seemed so pure. Her quietness, her slight smile, Mona Lisa's smile, her acceptance, and hearing her speak about her love for me. I've never had any woman love me the way she loved me. Even, even Janet was, did not touch this. I felt very fortunate to have her love, and it allowed me to be a much better teacher at satsang. What has broken my spirit to a certain extent was to watch her descend into this insanity of involvement about aliens possessing humans and uh, people eating babies and using their blood for energy and the sickness of the world she's fallen into and seeing I must have been so wrong thinking she was so totally distant from this kind of evil and now she embraces it it's her truth it's just broken me feel that my understanding of who she was is so far from what she's come now. Now, I guess Mark believes that she's fallen down a rabbit hole too. But to me, she was the key element of femininity in our Sangha. It gave it all a balance for me. Okay, over, out. Anybody want to speak? Um, hello, friends. 
I am not agree with your counting. Uh, for me, uh, I have a strong feeling that uh, Mary and Casey, they count for a lot more than us on the masculine side. And my feeling is coming down to energies. And the way they emit energies and the way they speak and their own vibration is so different than mine and, and most of us then. For me, they don't count as one unit. They count as a lot more than one unit. That's my feeling. Then I will have to say that. And don't worry about crying. I think it's very common for people dealing with energies. And uh, because it's, uh, we call it overloading, <laughs> then you have to be expressed. Then your body is completely full. And, and one way of expressing is crying. It's something that we experience when we are dealing with energy has happened to me many times, then there is no uh, point of worrying about that. I agree with Mark that it's very sensitive to record such a sad song for several reasons. I can understand that it's a transgression of privacy somehow, somewhere. I think this, what we call spirituality is something private and for many reasons. First, because we live in a society which is kind of mad and people can use this when you post it on internet or Facebook to a very evil way, right? And things have to be and stay private. Like all the spiritual teaching has been private. And for another reason is to protect the students from evil side. Um, when I was practicing with monks and uh, forest monks in Thailand, they always talk about that. Okay. When we make something special, we never say in advance. We hide it. We hide everything for what? To avoid, to inform the evils. Because energy evils coming. This is a practice I've been following for many years. And they have a lot of care of doing things hidden especially when we talk about some very sensitive subject, which are the one you talk, Eti. And because it can really be having many spirits coming to listen to you, and these spirits are on different sides. And it may occur that Angela had been touched by this because it was not enough secrecy. Have to be hidden. Is the reason why all the masters in the ancient time they hide and they teach to very few people, not because they don't want to promote themselves, because they want to be secret, because it's secret. And I think it's very important to respect these things, because it's a rule of teaching, is to keep it very hidden, very special for some people that can receive the message and not everybody. Uh, I think now the dangerous side is to spread it too much uh, I came here by Asa. No, I don't think so. I came here by Destiny or by Connection. I was watching you <clears throat> and I feel I have to contact you. I cannot say any logic point on that. I feel that I have to be one time with you guys. And, and when I see you guys and I feel a bit, uh, okay, I see there is a frequency. There is something that's connect to me. Okay, then I join it. Of course, and if I didn't watch you guys on YouTube, Maybe I never connect to this group. At the same time, I've been watching many groups and we never see the participants. In all the Sangha I saw in many places, we hide the face of the participant. We only see the instructor. Why to preserve the privacy of people and also the secrecy of the acting of transmission of very, very special messages. I love you. Hey. Um, there was a story about uh, the feminine energy when a bunch of saints go to Shiva and Shakti, like they were being Divine Mother and you know, a lot of heroes. Um, they uh, start worshipping, praising, except for one saint. And he says, uh, then they ask why you are not praying to Divine Mother. It's only Shiva, not Shakti. 
the, his mother and father, that he says, no, I have nothing to do with the feminine energy and I don't like, and it's only Shiva. So you start worshiping Shiva there. And then mother asked like, okay, so what do you mean by that? Uh, is there a place that I am not there? I said, I don't care. I don't want you. I just for she says, okay. If you don't want me, I'm with a dying. So that fellow's body and everything disappears, except his voice. Um, she says then, he realizes his mistake. Anyway, it's a story, right? And she says, it's me, your body, your energies, your blood, whatever you think it is, you, everything is me. You know, the consciousness of the thing that is Shiva. So it is the play of the universe and everything is me, she says. Just want to say, like, if any male could say, like, I am male, but there is no ma male there. It's only the female energy, and that's everywhere. But only the mind and thoughts think that it's male. Just want to say. To me, there's only one energy. It's not a masculine energy. There's no feminine energy. I don't divide that like that. And that's why I've never introduced worship of the feminine because I think women should worship the masculine and men should worship the feminine but that's only on the human level there's uh, that would cease to be of advantage at some point when you see that there's no difference between the sexes for human and that beingness is far deeper than the sexual distinction the gender but one more point, James brought it up. When you try to follow the teachings of two different teachers, you are going to be fucked up. It's inevitable. I remember when I came to Los Angeles to study under Dr. Tianan, I found more Zen masters there than there were in Kyoto. Matter of fact, the Kyoto Zen masters were in Los Angeles and everyone was different there's no common elements in their teachings if you follow one you better just follow one at a time to get what he has to offer and if you leave him then you can go to another teacher and stay with him as long as you can but when you try to integrate the teachings of five different Zen traditions, or even two different Zen teachers in the same tradition, you're going to get screwed up. You'll get confused. You won't, won't know how to practice. You don't know which practice to do first, because you'll have five or six or seven different practices. And you, you don't know which one to stick to. And it's utterly confusing. So no more than one teacher at a time. Then you can learn to disagree with them and fight with him or her all the time. But bear the center. Not splitting your allegiance to five different teachers, four different teachers, even two different teachers. Stick to one. I didn't like Ramana. I didn't understand. He used terms that were incredibly incredibly involved in on top the Egyptian Hindu ontology and he said he never got this understanding himself it was people that were interpreting what he was saying and then he'd say oh yeah yeah I agree with that so words are so unimportant and the practices themselves are really unimportant except the practice of staying close to yourself and finding yourself. Muktananda used to say all the time, honor yourself, worship yourself, love yourself. But back then, I, I could only say, I don't know what the self is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the self is. How can I worship it? How can I honor it? How can I revere it when I don't know what it is? Mm -hmm. Except something somewhere buried in me. Uh, out of bounds of consciousness. So I had to find that sense of self. And then I could follow his teachings, his energy teachings. 
anyway. Can I say something, Ed? I just want to say how grateful I am to all of you. There is, this is so rare in the world. What we have here is so rare. Where people really, really want to know the truth about themselves and everyone else. And I'm so grateful to you guys. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. What did you learn from us about you? Just being yourself. Just, just being yourself is so important. That's what, when I hear you, Ed, and you just come from that place of what you're feeling, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. You just do it. You just say it. It comes out and, and you're just being real and I can feel your realness and I just so appreciate that. Thank you. And, yeah. Ed, I've been, I've been sitting on uh, some ideas when you brought up the femininity thing and I remembered that my first satsang I attended, you said, feel your balls. I thought, oh, that's, that's not a very nice thing to say to, to women. Grab your balls and feel them, you said. Um, and then the next image that came up for me was back in Muktananda's ashram where there's this huge statue of Kali Durga. And you, you sit in front of this statue and she's got skulls in a, draped around her neck and she's on the back of a massive tiger that wants to rip your heart out. And, the, the, and, and it's, it says above the top, the little awesome one. And that, for me, gave me an insight into the power of feminine energy. It, 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 and, and I th personally felt that my accepted method of communication as a male had weapons in it that defended itself against, against women. And when I heard you say, feel your balls, I, I, I recognised that in me that I, I, like many of the people here, I've had plenty of feminine in my life too, and I, I love it. I really love it. And like Stevie, I, I felt that separation from that male group, tribal, let's go hunt and kill something thing. Um, so I was very aware of the unsaid and perhaps perhaps unexamined um, aspects of the male, which is actually in only there because it's scared shitless of Kali. So Kali energy is really, really strong. Cassie and I at one stage decided we should do puja to Kali. Well, shit happened. Really opened up and we said, oh my God, we better stop this because it was so strong. Uh, so, I'm not sure where this is taking me, but um, I don't, I looked at the numbers on my page here and there's plenty of lovely women and, you know, Muhammad doesn't show himself and, and Martin's not showing himself and some women aren't showing themselves, but I stick around after session. I see the beautiful Tove. Um, I don't think there's a problem in, in uh, feminine presence here. But I would uh, add to that, that for me personally, feminine presence is so strong anyway that it only needs one Kali. <laughs> and that there appears to be some sort of a hierarchical thing in my mind about feminine energy and male energy that the feminine energy is the creative energy. It is, it is what I come from. And, and then I decide whether I'm male or female. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's about it. You sure? Dig deeper. I'm sure you'll find something else. Yeah, it's always there. It's always there. Um, <laughs> living with Cassie is, is, uh, an ongoing powerful experience because I'm living with a woman who is very feminine and very strong. And in that sense, I see her as Kali. I really do. Yes. You know, I dread her uh, explosions. 
<laughs> and love them because they always change me. They always affect me and they always penetrate to that place, which as a male, I think has value. It has no value. It just doesn't even exist. But as long as I hold on to it, this Carly here has the ability to find it and poke at it and slash at it. Well, like Carly with the big sword. Uh, well, I forgot the sword. She's got a massive sort of scimitar. So, yeah. Um, I'm absolutely grateful that I'm in this relationship with her for more reasons than just Car just Cassie the woman. It, it, it's being in relationship, in intimate relationship with Carly. I agree. So I'm guessing that you probably had the same thing with Angela. You saw oh. that energy. And, uh, you and know, with had, Janet and with Dia. Yeah, as a man, there's a lot of fear there, you know, because you may be found out as the imposter. You may be found out that you, you're not the great lover that you're, you're pretending to, pretending to be. You may be found out that you really don't know where the next dollar's coming from and, and how to protect the house or what would happen and if a gang of men came and tried to rape her. You don't know any of that, but you don't want her to know that you don't know that. So the woman exposes the man. The woman that the, if that feminine entity just says, don't shit me, I'm here. Mary, response? You've heard a lot of stuff today. All over the map. What's your summarizing response? Can I say something? Yeah. Uh, I like Stevie one uh, I don't know, a few, some time ago, I noticed that on camera, there are not too many women. Or, yeah. And it feels like, the, yeah, it feels like we're not like the male or more. Uh, but I haven't thought about it until you said it, that Mary brought it. Like, I haven't thought that the male is more, like you can feel more the male energy than the female energy. And uh, I also, it, like Cassie said that oh, in the beginning of the satsang that about the crying and uh, of course I cry also and very easy. And And many, many times it's inappropriate. What? Many times it's not, it's inappropriate, you know, in a public space or why, why I try to say something. Uh, but I normally don't cry so much in front of other people. But I um, relate to Cassie and to Mary in the, sen in the sense that I have, I'm very emotional. We know. And I feel like I have been misunderstood for it. Yes. Selena, I understand totally, absolutely, and 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 our power is in our ability to cry. 
Yeah, but I also mean like when you're so emotional or so, like I change a lot. When you're so changeable and your emotions are all, all, all over the place, I have like instant, instinctively started thinking that I should suppress that or that I shouldn't. Mm. Because I, I have seen many times that men are hard, hard, can't handle it very well when they see it or when they are, um, yeah, uh, confronted with something like that. And that's why I, I learned to, or I hardly try to not express strong or hard emotions in front of other people. Even with Michael, when uh, I am in a heavy mood or in something like that, and he doesn't know what to do with me, he doesn't know how to react. He just, and, but the way he reacts is good enough because he normally just listens to me and just tries to be next to me and support me, and, and that's probably the, the best way. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the great lesson of men. Don't try to fix her, just listen. <laughs> but it's so, it's like, it works, it can work miracles. Absolutely. You are the gift. Absolutely. Gift. Thank you, Vaselina. Thank you, Vaselina, so much for opening up like that. That's beautiful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Beautiful. And Antoine, I'm afraid I don't agree with that point of view at all. And this is something I'm trying to stop in spirituality, which is to uh, have everything hidden. I want to expose everything. I'm sorry the gardener is here and I have to give him the key to get into the yard. I love you all. I love you all. Take care.